Hey, welcome back to the Urban Monk. Pedram here with Chris Jafaria, who is uh, doing some amazing work in the development of commercial space to be non-toxic and green. We spend most of our time indoors huffing paint and car carpet glue and all the stuff that's making us sick. And so he has found and identified a solution in how to change the way we finance and to change the way we build the blocks that we live in here so that we can do so healthfully. And it's gonna make a huge impact in energy and health. Enjoy the show. Philosophy, it's our understanding of wow, wait a second, sick buildings are out, this is why they're out, this is what we want to do to change that. Okay. So, um, our, our attention is on Black Diamond, Green Diamond is the, the philosophy. Got it. You've pioneered this division now within Black Diamond, and you're, you've been doing this real estate thing for a while, and so now Green Diamond is this division that's doing some really interesting work in the space of green buildings. So how did, how did this kind of come about and how did you break it out from the main thing into the green thing? Um, I think for you know the last several years following how commercial real estate development works and kind of the analytics behind commercial real estate and seeing all the progression that's made in you know the local and international environments, um, we've noticed a trend, uh, whether it, would, it was a, a trendy philosophy was that a lot of the large corporate type image companies wanted to be in sustainable uh, real estate for them and for all of their occupants. And for us, it was just you know kind of a passion project. Um, I was uh, in, in cahoots with uh, my cousin David Wolf, who's um, a well-known author, speaker, philanthropist, um, health advisor. And we're always wondering how we can get together and work together. He has um, shaped my understanding of the natural, metaphysical, physical world. And in turn, you know, I wanted to work with him on something that was extremely, um, something that I can support and get behind uh, with passion, not just on a business acumen. And I love development, I love commercial real estate, I love the finance world. It's something that I've been doing since you know, the last 10 years, if not longer. And after a, lo a nice trip in Kauai and spending some time on the land, um, we kind of came under the conclusion that you know uh, David's popularity and global reach had reached uh, a level that we've never expected, and that this is an angle of our development projects and our commercial real estate um, arms that we can collide forces and use um, his global reach with our ability to get these projects up and running. And that's how Green Diamond was formed under the umbrella of Black Diamond Group, which is our commercial real estate firm. Which you've been doing successfully for a long time. And Correct. so you're good at you know, financing buildings, putting up buildings, and making that happen. Mm -hmm. So then, and we did kind of a, a for our, our viewers and listeners, we did an early uh, interview with Dave Wolf about the kind of sick home, sick building, and what that uh, means and what that's about, but let's kind of draw a circle around that. Our commercial development of buildings is using non-sustainable uh, development kind of strategies and all that, and the the way the financing works kind of kind of nudges in that direction. And then once you're in that building, it's less healthy to be in there. So I'd love to kind of unpack that a little bit to identify the problem. Sure, and I think you you know you you, you kind of explained it. Um, you know, it seems that we got into a pattern and the pattern started you know in the 50s 60s 70s and carried on into developments even today in certain parts of this country and throughout the world what we notice is that we have different stakeholders coming into a development um, that are completely unattached with each other and unattached with that specific environment where these buildings are being built um, all the way down from the developer, all the way up to the hedge fund manager, to the local officials, to the architects, to the engineers, to the design capabilities. A lot of these different parties that are so instrument instrumental in building a project cohesively are actually so far apart in the process. And I noticed that on some of our development projects and looking at some of the projects that we were financing, and um, in turn, what happens is uh, this, that there's a lot of suffering that goes on 
within, um, within the building as far as it running to perfection on energy consumption, chemical, uh, uh, chemical limitations, different, different parts of the production of the building were cut off and not run, running together fluidly. And you know, the main disconnection pattern that, that came into my eyes was that most developments are funded by uh, hedge funds that have nothing to do with that given area and all they care about mainly, it's their fiduciary obligation, is to make as much profit as possible and move on to the next project. That seemed to be the main flaw that was causing the issues that we keep seeing with the sick building syndrome. And what's happening is they're investing into these buildings and with no foresight or no rather care of how this building is going to perform 5, 10, 15, 30 years, 50 years from now. Every building has a life cycle, you know, it's not just build the building up, get it going, have people, occupants move in and, and move on to another one. There's a whole responsibility that needs to be taken place when these buildings are designed and built. And it's a f very thorough thought process that needs to go into this. So the guys that are funding the building are getting a quick burn in turn, getting some sort of you know, return on it. Internal rate of return. Internal IRR mm -hmm. and then saying, okay, good, we got our money out, we're out, now who buys the thing? And then who's stuck with it is the question. Yeah, uh, they sell it off to different real estate investment trusts, to different private investment groups. Um, sometimes they keep them on their balance sheet for a year or two and send them off. Uh, there's a whole multitude of ways um, that we've been seeing this reoccurring. Every single way um, has been showing that there hasn't been a significant um, approach to really building and designing a building that's going to withstand a lot of the issues that we're seeing today with sick buildings. And that's the, again, that's a problem, and that's the code that we seem to have cracked. So before we get into the cracking of the code, mm -hmm. which is the exciting news for humanity here, what makes a building sick? What chemicals, what, I mean, is it the air, the ventilation, all the above? All the above. Yeah, you know, initially we thought it was the chemicals, it was the raw materials, it was the displacement of natural resources and animals and whatnot, but when you look into it more, it's unbelievable. You have all these large, huge cities that are being ran by coal plants, petroleum plants. What's energizing all of these buildings? Mm -hmm. What's giving it the power to them? Something has to burn somewhere in the, you know, in the distance to keep these lights on, to keep these big massive air conditioning systems on, to keep these elevators and escalators and subways and all these different types of power that's needed. Something's burning, CO2 is uh, emitting, carbon emissions are extremely high from this. This is, this is the problem. 49% mm. of our carbon emissions in this country, believe it or not, are coming from buildings. Wow. That's taking into effect cars and everything else. It's coming from buildings. That's a problem. And so once you saw this, uh, and then there's a lot of like habitat and all these types of things and urban planning. There's a lot of ways that we've been kind of dumb about how, you know, unless people stop having babies, we need to keep building housing. Right? Absolutely. And you know, and this is coming from a guy who's like slanted liberal. Like, I'm sorry, people need to live somewhere. Right? Abs absolutely. So when we, when we have this kind of uh, urban planning thing in front of us, we need to think that through and say, okay, where's the best place to do it and all that. And now, how the hell do we power this? Yeah. What, what are we doing? I mean, so, so can we go solar? Can we go wind on the outside? Or can the buildings be more efficient? Like, how do we do it? It's a combination of everything there. You want to kind of hit it on all sides. It's not, solar's not going to be our complete answer. Wind is not going to be our complete answer. But these are solutions to a big problem overall. And we want to hit it on all levels, whether it's the design of the building, the location of how we position the building with the sun, solar panels that rotate on the roof, rainwater capture. Again, a building is toxic for multiple reasons, for energy, for waste consumption, raw materials. We want to hit it on all levels. Today, with the technology that's out there, with the, with the mines that are out there, international groups that are out there that have been r running in this industry for a while now. I've been studying them and learning who they are and, and, and speaking with them. There are so many different opportunities here that we, can, that we can use to keep our energy consumptions at a minimal 
And that, again, starts with the right philosophy and the right plan from the beginning. So going in with the right philosophy and plan is something that most of us can do. I could go in there and be like, hey, guys, I, you know, I want to do this. But I don't know how the financing works. So I, I'll go in and then all of a sudden someone will be like, no, kid, that's not how things work. This right. dude buys it and it's, this costs too much. Sure. We're not going to be able to do it. How do we hack the financial elements? Well, we got to show them that it's not just a moral case to build green, it's a business case to build green. That's the key right there. Yeah. Because ultimately, there's going to have to be profit margins. People are going to have to make money. And then at the same time, you know, things like what we want to do is we want to create our own capital. We call it conscious capital. It's we want to raise our own dollars. We want our own people to be investing in the built environment that we live in. Mm -hmm. I don't want some fund manager you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 miles away taking what's mine in my environment so they can make a profit and leave us more exposed and leave our children more exposed. So, you know, it's, it's creating different debt instruments. It's really showing a business case for building green by cutting energy costs. We're saving a lot of money on the bottom line for our investors. If you're, if you're cutting energy by 80%, what is that doing to your bottom line on an annual basis? Again, we want our investors to stay in these projects long term. If we're going to sell these projects, once these, uh, once these properties are stabilized, we want the right conscious investors to come in and take them on. You know, there's a lot of real estate investment trusts out there. These are groups of investors that have bought multiple types of assets and put them all under one umbrella that understand what sustainable works. I mean, what a better representation than a, a real estate investment trust that owns 30, 40 properties on their balance sheet. They're showing us that they want sustainable properties. Mm -hmm. They see the savings because of the energy consumption, because of the waste consumption, and how, that, that, and how those uh, savings have contributed to their, to their respective groups making more money. How long? How long does it take? So obviously, uh, not obviously, but I'm assuming it's going to be more expensive to build the right way in green on the front end. How long before you can? I'll, kind of I'll stop you right there. That's not, not. That's not accurate. Great. You know, I love that. Yeah, I mean, it's just like any other technology, any new concept. When it's fairly new, it's going to be pricier because you got to bring in a group. They got to come do their own design. It's going to take a little bit more time. Materials Some cost. Materials cost is going to cost a little bit more. But once we tip the balance of the supply and demand change, these things are changing, and they're changing right now. Look at cities like San Francisco, cities like Pasadena. You can't even get permits for buildings through city council without having at least some type of sustainability aspect to your project. They're demanding it right now, and Man. this is what we want, this is what we need. This is exactly uh, the direction that needs to be taken because we don't really have a choice at this point. So there's legislative mandates, mm -hmm. which is great, and I'm yeah. all for it. Uh, but there's also kind of market demands. Mm -hmm. So the a LEED certified building, a green building, is, de is demanding more rent and kind of these marquee tenants Absolutely. are happy to pay it. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's very interesting, and, and I, I thank God for this, because Trendy has worked out very well from here for, for, for this matter, and our environment is... Uh, is you know is thanking us for it. LEED is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's a rating agency that was developed by actually a, a friend of ours, uh, David Godfrey, and among other among other of his constituents. And they developed a rating agency to rate how well your building saves energy, saves waste consumption, does you know all the different uh, levels of sustainability. Um, and uh, your question was, so. The tenants that go Got in, okay. I would pay for. Yeah. I would pay higher rent if I knew I wasn't getting poisoned in some room. Absolutely. Let's say you have a Salesforce office of you know two, three thousand employees. If they're in a green building with good lighting, with good circulation, they know they're in a sustainable building. The brick and mortar's out. The asbestos is out. You're going to get a lot better employee production as opposed to. Um, something that's going to be uh, a lot more toxic, something that's darker, something that's, uh, th that's where these corporate companies are going. Mm -hmm. They're going to, they're, they're, their branding is representing who they are as a global firm and they want to stand with us as far as green development is concerned. And it's paying off dividends for them all around. 
There's also a recruitment aspect to this where uh, the labor pool, and, and this is something that I didn't really understand because you just assume there's like people everywhere and everything's so damn crowded that like, you know, population overgrowth and this, that, and the other. The baby boomer thing has kind of come and gone out of the workforce and the millennial generation coming in, there's not as many people to fill the jobs, so like it's become a, a, a much more competitive landscape. So someone wants wellness, someone wants a green building. Like these people that they're trying to recruit into their companies actually are demanding this type of stuff, which is also it's a consumer sentiment and employee sentiment, which is great. It's awesome. It's happening right now, particularly in the Bay Area. If you go all the way down from Silicon Valley all the way up to the you know tops of uh, Marin County, most of the m most of these firms are bringing in the right people that are demanding exactly what you're saying because mm -hmm. it's the culture now. People want to be healthy. People want to be enthusiastic going to work. People want to know that they're creating um, you know, a, a situation for people to, to produce and to, to really take things to the next level in their careers and their health. It, it's incredible. I mean, you have uh, you know, a lot of these uh, campuses that are being built right now, that's, you know, physical education is one of the main components, spiritual education. Mm -hmm. This is the climate that we're in right now. Yeah. And thank God for it. Yeah, I was going to say, it took a while, but we finally turned that corner. Oh, those 80s. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so on the front end, we have uh, prices starting to come down and we have some efficiencies mm -hmm. and we can start to get, I mean, I mean, there's mandates and all that, but, you know, let's just say it's even more expensive to build green still and that's changing. But if you can hold the asset long I'll enough. I'll just jump in right here. Another thing that we're looking at, I mentioned earlier, is that the cities get involved, is that we work with you know, local and state officials, federal officials as well, about getting tax subsidies. You know, when, you start a, when you start a development process, one of the, lar one of the major you know, capital expenditures that you need to look at is the go-in cost and the tax cost. Right now, a lot of local cities, a lot of counties, are encouraging green developments and the way they're encouraging it for private investors such as ourselves and our groups and whatnot is you know they'll cut the tax uh, expenses which very much em empower us to be able to build mm. these projects because we're, we're getting a you know a clear savings which any other carryover money would go towards building green mm. um, and, and it creates a, it creates a very solid balance these are things that we want to get more involved with we want to start really working with uh, you know the the local uh, uh, officials and whatnot. So they create the incentives. They give you tax breaks, mm -hmm. so it actually pencils out on the front end to go green. And then, how much? What percentage are we saying? You said uh, you threw a number like eighty percent. Uh, people are saving up to eighty percent on like what power bills and these types of things by having energy efficient uh, buildings. Absolutely, water because it, it goes all it goes all the way around. Water consumption. I mean, you know, some of the new technology for waste removal is is removing water almost altogether. It's incredible. You have trash. You have energy. Um, all of these things add up, especially the larger facility you go. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're seeing sav savings on average anywhere between 50 to, to 80, up to 80 percent. Wow. And it, and it just really depends on how far they're willing to go as far as, you know, the type of technology they're using. There are buildings out there that are considered living, breathing ecosystems. It's very fascinating. Mm. There's a book um, that talked about kind of the or original humans being kind of cave dwellers and how, mm -hmm. you know, there's urban metropolis and it's like we all kind of lived in caves on cliffs and, and you know, there's trees everywhere. Genius. Genius, right? And, yeah. and, and so there, there's a lot of movement in this direction. Mm -hmm. I've seen some interesting things where it's like they capture sunlight with prisms and kind of chuck it around inside so like there's actual natural light inside these huge skyscrapers. It's incredible. This isn't like futuristic, like we have this now. No, we've been having this technology for a while. It's been right in front of our face we had it as children and it's becoming fun and that's the exciting part of it is that there's it's it's, it's you know you lead it leave it up to the imagination for us to be able to create something that's tangible that makes sense I mean what's better than that that's that's the best ever how much time do we spend indoors at these places we call work right eight hours a day a lot five days a week a lot most of our life Yes, absolutely. Yep. And, and just think about the difference it will make for the health mm -hmm. of your employees and for mm -hmm. the health of you know, your, your fellow workers. It, it, it makes such a big difference. I mean, we're, we're humans. Let's be real here. We're not designed to be inside man-made structures. 
Mm -hmm. that's, that's the reality of it. We're supposed to be running around on the beach, in the mountains, in the fresh air. And if we are not designing these buildings to have the proper circulation, the fundamental energy of being outside, which in effect is what a green building is, we're doing a major disservice. We're creating a lot of sickness within the building. This is, it's, it's just bad all around. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, this, is very, this is very important. And another thing I'd like to add is, you know, less is more when it comes to building a sustainable building. The less materials you use, the better. It's, we don't need all that rebar, all that concrete, all that wood, all that lead, all of that's out. The new technologies are showing that it's glass and steel hmm. and everything that we can fill in in between to make that structure stand. That's, that's a big deal. You know. Okay, so we have new buildings, which are obviously moving us in the right direction. Correct. And there's people that are building in this way, and there's people that go back, kick it old school, and build you know, the way they used to and burn and turn. So yeah. we're trying to influence the new buildings. What old buildings? Mm-hmm. Uh, can we go retrofit them? Mm-hmm. Do we got to demo them? Like what, what needs to happen with the toxic buildings that a lot of us are stuck in? I think that's a great question. I think it's really going to depend on the building. You know, so I can't really answer that on a general term. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, retrofit is incredible, especially when it comes to the windows. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what's interesting is most windows on buildings that have not been built for sustainability are basically energy wasters. They're losing all of the energy as far as in the summertime, if it's, uh, if it's hot and you wanna keep it cool, that's not, ca- that's not keeping the cool, and vice versa, it's not trapping the heat. Retrofitting windows is, is very important. Changing the paint out, VOC-free paint, paint we wanna stay away from, those chemicals are extremely hazardous. Um, different, you know, re- replacing the HVAC systems. HVAC systems is about 25, 30% of a building's energy. And most of those in regular buildings are 90% wasteful. 90%. Wow. That is incredible. Is that because of just the, 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 the piping isn't right? Like what makes them so wasteful? They build them so massive. They do not disperse them correctly. Because most HVAC systems, I think you've seen them before in like an old hotels or you see them in the garage. Sure. And they got like, you know, tons of dust around them and they're cranking on, uh, you know, they're cranking all the time because they got to feed the beast, essentially. Mm-hmm. Those are pumping out air conditioning to hundreds of vacant rooms, hundreds of vacant lobbies all the time. There's no rhyme or reason. It's, it's incredible. And the mm-hmm. reason why a lot of these buildings are doing that is because they're all owned by a large corporation who is not specifically analyzing each property's energy conception and puts it all under one mm-hmm. global uh, you know, financial scale. And it's, it's, it's horrible. It's, I mean, I, I want to save them money. You know? Mm-hmm. We, mm-hmm. Need to, you know, we need to design systems that are more efficient and less chemicals. That's essentially what yeah. it is. It's, it's really about efficiency here, being smart. Yeah, and then if you're listening to this saying, how the hell does this apply to me, mm-hmm. is that means less smog in your air and less mercury in your sushi. <laughs> <laughs> right? That, essentially. Yeah, you're burning coal to power all this crap, right? And so you're saying 50% of our consumption can be optimized and become a lot more efficient, and then we can start moving uh, you know, the energy grid to more sustainable things. I mean, we can make a really big dent in the way we generate energy, and the way we use energy, for 50% of our consumption in this country, and we're the biggest polluter. Pedro, we can make a massive dent. It's very, it's very interesting. If you look at the actual analytics, the evidence points that just a slight difference in the next 10 years can shift our carbon emissions uh, you know, pr- completely. And this has to happen. We're, we're in an area right now in our environment where a lot of our systems are failing drastically. This is, this is very critical. So we seem to be tilting over and having um, a shift in the kind of political will, which sounds great. There's cities, municipalities, they're doing this stuff. Yes. Uh, but one of the things that I find incredibly relevant for you know the optimism of the future is you guys have kind of cracked the code on this financial model mm-hmm. because Business is business, and you know, if a pencil's out, a pencil's out, and like corporations just go for what they do, and there's externalities and all that. Sure. But so now there's a business case, yes, which takes the the, the powerful force of of capitalism, right, and aligns it with ecology, with kind of sustainable development, yes. And so, 
from finance all the way through holding this thing. Just kind of walk us through a little bit of the life cycle of how you have to change the finance of this so that it makes sense. Yes. So um, essentially, we understand now that the power is back with the people. And what I mean by that is that if we want to build it to be sustainable, we have to finance it ourselves with groups, like-minded individuals, and we got to show and really illustrate that there is a business case to building green. Your financial model will be healthier with a sustainable building. It's not top secret, it's not rocket science, it's very simple. If I can save your energy costs by, let's say, 25%, what will that do to your bottom line on an annual basis? Most finance instruments are five to 10 year programs. Do the math, multiply that by five or 10, show the savings, it's a no brainer. Mm. And now the evidence is there that we can show this to the banks, to the lenders, the buildings that have been green that we've been reading and understanding have been out there for 10 plus years. We have a couple of them we're reviewing right now that are in Seattle, we have a couple in LA, a couple in San Francisco, a couple in Germany. The evidence is there, the statistics are there. It's not something that we're making up, that we have no agenda. We can show them that on a 10 year return saves them drastic amount of money. You save 10% on a financial instru instrument on a 10 year basis, that changes the whole uh, structure and how you put that deal together. It's, yep. it's incredible and then at the same time, you know, with our, with our network, with what I'm doing with my cousin David, what I'm doing with you. Uh, ultimately, our, our next couple projects, we want to finance ourselves. We want to hold on to these projects. We want to hold on to these ap assets after they stabilize. These are going to be beautiful class A green developments that inspire, that help people, um, that replace any possibility of a sick building being there. These are going to be built regardless. We're going to might as well build them green. And we're excited to do that. So, and there's, there's something in there that I want to unpack real quickly, which is um, you have two projects side by side. One is built the old way, which over time is going to cost more money in kind of, you know, just operations. And then the green one, which saves, saves you money in the long run and, you know, definitely makes a business case for, you know, the 10 year performa, whatever. Sure. Uh, but then when you're looking at these two assets side by side, same square footage, same everything, same everything. I'm assuming that the green building will hold its value, if not you know, more, side by side for someone who wants to buy it? Exponentially, <laughs> exponentially, almost 40% more. That's the statistics right now. If you take a look at lead buildings versus regular you know, sick buildings, they're trading at a you know, rate of about 40% more per square footage. It's, okay. inc it's, it's, it's incredible, I mean. S same thing, it's got a, it's got a gourmet, uh, gourmet thing on it and people sure. will pay more. Absolutely, they'll pay more rent, thus creating a higher value when you wanna, when you wanna purchase the property. Cause, cause, okay, so at the end of the day, the value is based on what the perceived value in the rent is that the occupants want and then since the occupants want this, the value of the building goes up. Absolutely. This to me is really interesting because it goes back to the history of organics. Yes. We didn't have an organic industry. Mm -hmm. There was a few people that kind of pushed it ahead and said, look, I choose this. I'm willing to pay more for it. Yeah. And those early adopters basically forced the hand into a, you know, it's like an $8.5 billion industry and like, you know, going gangbusters and it's basically taking over the way we do things. Mm -hmm. Why? Because people wanted it. So now if, if you're in a business. If you're running the show somewhere and you want to do the right thing for your employees, you want to do the right thing for your people and the community and the environment and everything, let alone your pocketbook, you start wanting to get into these buildings, you start nudging your way into these buildings, bring the demand up. If you work for a company, start nudging your HR and saying, hey listen, what can we do to green up this building? As that demand and that sentiment goes up, it starts to drive the industry, it brings down costs and then 10 years, 15 years from now, fast forward, 
we've got ourselves a real environmental solution and we live in healthy buildings with fresh air and good sunlight and it just makes good sense. You, you just hit it right on the nail. It all comes down to the consumer, to the tenant, to the occupants. They're the ones that demand the developers and the owners of these properties to build them green. So again, it's a matter of getting the word out there and driving that energy and having everyone understand exactly how important this issue is. I love it. I love it. Man, you're doing such great work. Um, I, I'm obviously following. We're buddies and like, you know, we're, we're, we're in cahoots to save the world here. So that's, <laughs> that's not a conspiracy. Everyone's just trying to help. Um, where can people follow the work of Black Diamond and Green Diamond and how you're doing this? Because this is, this is a case study that's a growing body of, of evidence supporting what we're talking about. Absolutely. And I just wanted to add that, you know, we have one of our trademark uh, assets that are going up in Palo Alto, California, a couple blocks from Stanford University. This is a class A mixed use property, mixed use meaning office, retail and residential components that's capturing about 12 components of green sustainability um, uh, aspects to it. Organic rooftop garden, beautiful HVAC systems, raw materials, the solar, the whole nine yards, charging stations, everything. Uh, this is a great asset. This should be ready in the next couple months. Um, I'm really happy and excited about that. Uh, you can get in touch with us online through blackdiamondgroup.com. That's spelled B-L-A-Q-K, diamondgroup.com. Our Facebook as well. Uh, our partner, David Wolf. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people don't know who he is. He's our partner. Um, and, uh, you know, working with you on everything that you're doing. This is, uh, the time is now. We're ready to move forward, you know. But, you know, they had their way. It's, it's yeah. you know, it's, it's time. Well, humanity's gone through its adolescence. We're growing sure. up. We're, yeah. figu we're figuring it out. So. Yeah. And uh, we're going to put some cameras on that building. We're going to show what this thing looks like. Mm -hmm. It's a prototype for how we can do buildings in the future. Mm -hmm. And it isn't some sort of like decadent gourmet over expenditure to no. say, oh, well, this is cute, but it doesn't pencil out. It pencils out. Right. So it is the future. Yes. So, man, I'm excited. Let's, let's get after this. And All let's right. fix the world. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. So now you might be thinking to yourself, how does this apply to me? I'm not a real estate developer, but the consumer drives the demand, which drives the market. So if you're in a work environment, start talking to the people that are in charge of this to say, hey, can we get some non-toxic carpet? Can we get some more lights, some more VOC plants? Start driving the narrative in that direction. They want you to be happy. They will get you what you want if you get enough people asking for it. So start driving an internal revolution in your company or your workplace, which will eventually get you to be exposed to less poison, more oxygen, and you're going to make the world a better place. So enjoy this, share this. I'll see you next week.